Peter Goldthwaite's treasure. Nathaniel Hawthorne. And so, Peter, you won't even consider of the business? said Mr. John Brown, buttoning his situ over the snug rotundity of his person, and drawing on his gloves. You positively refuse to let me have this crazy old house, and the land under and adjoining, at the price named? Neither at that, nor treble the sum, responded the gaunt, grizzled, and threadbare Peter Goldthwaite. The fact is, Mr. Brown, you must find another site for your brick block, and be content to leave my estate with the present owner. Next summer, I intend to put a splendid new mansion over the cellar of the old house. For, Peter, cried Mr. Brown, as he opened the kitchen door, content yourself with building castles in the air, where house lots are cheaper than on earth, to say nothing of the cost of bricks and mortar. Such foundations are solid enough for your edifices, while this underneath us is just the thing for mine, and so we may both be suited. What say you again? Precisely what I said before, Mr. Brown, answered Peter Goldthwaite. And as for castles in the air, mine may not be as magnificent as that sort of architecture, but perhaps as substantial, Mr. Brown, as the very respectable brick block with dry goods stores, tailor's shops, and banking rooms on the lower floor, and lawyer's offices in the second story, which you are so anxious to substitute. And the cost, Peter, eh? said Mr. Brown as he withdrew, in something of a pet. That, I suppose, will be provided for, offhand, by drawing a check on Bubble Bank. John Brown and Peter Goldthwaite had been jointly known to the commercial world between twenty and thirty years before, under the firm of Goldthwaite and Brown, which co-partnership, however, was speedily dissolved by the natural incongruity of its constituent parts. Since that event, John Brown, with exactly the qualities of a thousand other John Browns, and by just such plodding methods as they used, had prospered wonderfully, and become one of the wealthiest John Browns on earth. Peter Goldthwaite, on the contrary, after innumerable schemes, which ought to have collected all the coin on paper currency of the country into his coffers, was as needy a gentleman as ever wore a patch upon his elbow. The contrast between him and his former partner may be briefly marked for Brown never reckoned upon luck, yet always had it, while Peter made luck the main condition of his projects, and always missed it. While the means held out, his speculations had been magnificent, but were chiefly confined, of late years, to such small business as adventures in the lottery. Once he had gone on a gold-gathering expedition somewhere to the south, and ingeniously contrived to empty his pockets more thoroughly than ever, while others, doubtless, were filling theirs with native bullion by the handful. More recently he had expended a legacy of a thousand or two of dollars in purchasing Mexican scrip, and thereby became the proprietor of a province, which, however, so far as Peter could find out, was situated where he might have had an empire for the same money comma in the clouds. From a search after this valuable real estate Peter returned so gaunt and threadbare that, on reaching New England, the scarecrows in the cornfields beckoned to him as he passed by. They did but flutter in the wind, quoth Peter Goldthwaite. No, Peter, they beckoned, for the scarecrows knew their brother. At the period of our story his whole visible income would not have paid the tax of the old mansion in which we find him. It was one of those rusty, moss-grown, many-peaked wooden houses, which are scattered about the streets of our elder towns, with a beetle-browed second story projecting over the foundation as if it frowned at the novelty around it. This old paternal edifice, needy as he was, and though, being centrally situated on the principal street of the town, it would have brought him a handsome sum, the sagacious Peter had his own reasons for never parting with, either by auction or private sale. There seemed, indeed, to be a fatality that connected him with his birthplace, for, often as he had stood on the verge of ruin, and standing there even now, he had not yet taken the step beyond it which would have compelled him to surrender the house to his creditors. So here he dwelt with bad luck till good should come. Here then in his kitchen, the only room where a spark of fire took off the chill of a November evening, poor Peter Goldthwaite had just been visited by his rich old partner. At the close of their interview, Peter, with rather a mortified look, glanced downwards at his dress parts of which appeared as ancient as the days of Goldthwaite and Brown. 
His upper garment was a mixed situ, roughly faded, and patched with newer stuff on each elbow. Beneath this he wore a threadbare black coat, some of the silk buttons of which had been replaced with others of a different pattern, and lastly, though he lacked not a pair of grey pantaloons, they were very shabby ones, and had been partially turned brown by the frequent toasting of Peter's shins before a scanty fire. Peter's person was in keeping with his goodly apparel. Grey-headed, hollow-eyed, pale-cheeked, and lean-bodied, he was the perfect picture of a man who had fed on windy schemes and empty hopes, till he could neither live on such unwholesome trash, nor stomach more substantial food. But, with all, this Peter Goldthwaite, crack-brained simpleton as, perhaps, he was, might have cut a very brilliant figure in the world, had he employed his imagination in the airy business of poetry, instead of making it a demon of mischief in mercantile pursuits. After all, he was no bad fellow, but as harmless as a child, and as honest and honourable, and as much of the gentleman which nature meant him for, as an irregular life and depressed circumstances will permit any man to be. As Peter stood on the uneven bricks of his hearth, looking round at the disconsolate old kitchen, his eyes began to kindle with the illumination of an enthusiasm that never long deserted him. He raised his hand, clinched it, and smote it energetically against the smoky panel over the fireplace. The time is come, said he. With such a treasure at command, it were folly to be a poor man any longer. Tomorrow morning I will begin with the garret nor desist till I have torn the house down. Deep in the chimney corner, like a witch in a dark cavern, sat a little old woman, mending one of the two pairs of stockings wherewith Peter Goldthwaite kept his toes from being frostbitten. As the feet were ragged past all darning, she had cut pieces out of a cast-toe flannel petticoat, to make new soles. Tabitha Porter was an old maid, upwards of sixty years of age, fifty-five of which she had sat in that same chimney corner such being the length of time since Peter's grandfather had taken her from the almshouse. She had no friend but Peter, nor Peter any friend but Tabitha, so long as Peter might have a shelter for his own head, Tabitha would know where to shelter hers, or, being homeless elsewhere, she would take her master by the hand and bring him to her native home, the almshouse. Should it ever be necessary, she loved him well enough to feed him with her last morsel, and clothe him with her under petticoat. But Tabitha was a queer old woman, and, though never infected with Peter's flightiness, has become so accustomed to his freaks and follies that she viewed them all as matters of course. Hearing him threaten to tear the house down, she looked quietly up from her work. Best leave the kitchen till the last, Mr. Peter, said she. The sooner we have it all down the better, said Peter Goldthwaite. I am tired to death of living in this cold, dark, windy, smoky, creaking, groaning, dismal old house. I shall feel like a younger man when we get into my splendid brick mansion, as, please heaven, we shall by this time next autumn. You shall have a room on the sunny side, old tabby, finished and furnished as best may suit your own notions. I should like it pretty much such a room as this kitchen, answered Tabitha. It will never be like home to me till the chimney corner gets as black with smoke as this, and that won't be these hundred years. How much do you mean to lay out on the house, Mr. Peter? What is that to the purpose? exclaimed Peter, loftily. Did not my great-granduncle, Peter Goldthwaite, who died seventy years ago, and whose namesake I am, leave treasure enough to build twenty such? I can't say but he did, Mr. Peter, said Tabitha, threading her needle. Tabitha well understood that Peter had reference to an immense hoard of the precious metals, which was said to exist somewhere in the cellar or walls, or under the floors, or in some concealed closet, or other out of the way nook of the house. This wealth, according to tradition, had been accumulated by a former Peter Goldthwaite, whose character seems to have borne a remarkable similitude to that of the Peter of our story. Like him he was a wild projector, seeking to heap up gold by the bushel and the cartload, instead of scraping it together, coin by coin. Like Peter the Second. Two, his projects had almost invariably failed, and, but for the magnificent success of the final one, would have left him with hardly a coat and pair of breeches to his gaunt and grizzled person. Reports were various as to the nature of his fortunate speculation, 
one intimating that the ancient Peter had made the gold by alchemy, another, that he had conjured it out of people's pockets by the black art, and a third, still more unaccountable, that the devil had given him free access to the old provincial treasury. It was affirmed, however, that some secret impediment had debarred him from the enjoyment of his riches, and that he had a motive for concealing them from his heir, or at any rate had died without disclosing the place of deposit. The present Peter's father had faith enough in the story to cause the cellar to be dug over. Peter himself chose to consider the legend as an indisputable truth, and, amid his many troubles, had this one consolation that, should all other resources fail, he might build up his fortunes by tearing his house down. Yet, unless he felt a lurking distrust of the golden tail, it is difficult to account for his permitting the paternal roof to stand so long, since he had never yet seen the moment when his predecessor's treasure would not have found plenty of room in his own strong box. But now was the crisis. Should he delay the search a little longer, the house would pass from the lineal heir, and with it the vast heap of gold, to remain in its burial place, till the ruin of the aged walls should discover it to strangers of a future generation. Yes! cried Peter Goldthwaite, again, tomorrow I will set about it. The deeper he looked at the matter the more certain of success grew Peter. His spirits were naturally so elastic that even now, in the blasted autumn of his age, he could often compete with the springtime gaiety of other people. Enlivened by his brightening prospects, he began to caper about the kitchen like a hobgoblin, with the queerest antics of his lean limbs, and gesticulations of his starved features. Nay, in the exuberance of his feelings, he seized both of Tabitha's hands, and danced the old lady across the floor, till the oddity of her rheumatic motions set him into a roar of laughter, which was echoed back from the rooms and chambers, as if Peter Goldthwaite were laughing in every one. Finally he bounded upward almost out of sight, into the smoke that clouded the roof of the kitchen, and, alighting safely on the floor again, endeavoured to resume his customary gravity. Tomorrow, at sunrise, he repeated, taking his lamp to retire to bed, I'll see whether this treasure be hid in the wall of the garret. And as we're out of wood, Mr. Peter, said Tabitha, puffing and panting with her late gymnastics, as fast as you tear the house down. I'll make a fire with the pieces. Gorgeous that night were the dreams of Peter Goldthwaite. At one time he was turning a ponderous key in an iron door not unlike the door of a sepulchre, but which, being opened, disclosed a vault heaped up with gold coin, as plentifully as golden corn in a granary. There were chaste goblets, also, and tureens, salvers, dinner dishes, and dish covers of gold, or silver gilt, besides chains and other jewels incalculably rich, though tarnished with the damps of the vault, for, of all the wealth that was irrevocably lost to the man, whether buried in the earth or sunken in the sea, Peter Goldthwaite had found it in this one treasure place. Anon, he had returned to the old house as poor as ever, and was received at the door by the gaunt and grizzled figure of a man whom he might have mistaken for himself, only that his garments were of a much elder fashion. But the house, without losing its former aspect, had been changed into a palace of the precious metals. The floors, walls, and ceiling were of burnished silver, the doors, the window frames, the cornices, the balustrades and the steps of the staircase, of pure gold, and silver, with gold bottoms, were the chairs, and gold, standing on silver legs, the high chests of drawers, and silver the bedsteads, with blankets of woven gold, and sheets of silver tissue. The house had evidently been transmuted by a single touch, for it retained all the marks that Peter remembered, but in gold or silver instead of wood, and the initials of his name, which, when a boy, he had cut in the wooden doorpost, remained as deep in the pillar of gold. A happy man would have been Peter Goldthwaite except for a certain ocular deception, which, whenever he glanced backwards, caused the house to darken from its glittering magnificence into the sordid gloom of yesterday. Up, betimes, rose Peter, seized an axe, hammer, and saw, which he had placed by his bedside, and hired him to the garret. It was but scantily lighted up, as yet, by the frosty fragments of a sunbeam, which began to glimmer through the almost opaque bullseyes of the window. A moralizer might find abundant themes for his speculative and impracticable wisdom in a garret. There is the limbo of departed fashions, aged trifles. 
of a day, and whatever was valuable only to one generation of men, and which passed to the garret when that generation passed to the grave, not for safe keeping, but to be out of the way. Peter saw piles of yellow and musty account books, in parchment covers, wherein creditors, long dead and buried, had written the names of dead and buried debtors in ink now so faded that their moss-grown tombstones were more legible. He found old moth-eaten garments all in rags and tatters, or Peter would have put them on. Here was a naked and rusty sword, not a sword of service, but a gentleman's small French rapier, which had never left its scabbard till it lost it. Here were canes of twenty different sorts, but no gold-headed ones, and shoe buckles of various pattern and material, but not silver nor set with precious stones. Here was a large box full of shoes, with high heels and peaked toes. Here, on a shelf, were a multitude of files, half filled with old apothecary stuff, which, when the other half had done its business on Peter's ancestors, had been brought hither from the death chamber. Here not to give a longer inventory of articles that will never be put up at auction was the fragment of a full-length looking-glass, which, by the dust and dimness of its surface, made the picture of these old things look older than the reality. When Peter not knowing that there was a mirror there, caught the faint traces of his own figure, he partly imagined that the former Peter Goldthwaite had come back, either to assist or impede his search for the hidden wealth. And at that moment a strange notion glimmered through his brain that he was the identical Peter who had concealed the gold, and ought to know whereabout it lay. This, however, he had unaccountably forgotten. Well, Mr. Peter, cried Tabitha, on the garret stairs, have you torn the house down enough to heat the tea kettle? Not yet, old Tabby, answered Peter, but that's soon done as you shall see. With the word in his mouth, he uplifted the axe and laid about him so vigorously that the dust flew, the boards crashed, and, in a twinkling, the old woman had an apron full of broken rubbish. We shall get our winter's wood cheap, quoth Tabitha. The good work being thus commenced, Peter beat down all before him, smiting and hewing at the joists and timbers, unclenching spike nails, ripping and tearing away boards, with a tremendous racket, from morning till night. He took care, however, to leave the outside shell of the house untouched, so that the neighbours might not suspect what was going on. Never, in any of his vagaries, though each had made him happy while it lasted, had Peter been happier than now. Perhaps, after all, there was something in Peter Goldthwaite's turn of mind, which brought him an inward recompense for all the external evil that it caused. If he were poor, ill-clad, even hungry, and exposed, as it were, to be utterly annihilated by a precipice of impending ruin, yet only his body remained in these miserable circumstances, while his aspiring soul enjoyed the sunshine of a bright futurity. It was his nature to be always young, and the tendency of his mode of life to keep him so. Grey hairs were nothing, no, nor wrinkles, nor infirmity, he might look old, indeed, and be somewhat disagreeably connected with a gaunt old figure, much the worse for wear, but the true. The essential Peter was a young man of high hopes, just entering on the world. At the kindling of each new fire, his burnt-out youth rose afresh from the old embers and ashes. It rose exulting now. Having lived thus long not too long, but just to the right age a susceptible bachelor, with warm and tender dreams, he resolved, so soon as the hidden gold should flash to light, to go a-wooing, and win the love of the fairest maid in town. What heart could resist him? Happy Peter Goldthwaite. Every evening as Peter had long absented himself from his former lounging places, at insurance offices, newsrooms, and bookstores, and as the honour of his company was seldom requested in private circles he and Tabitha used to sit down sociably by the kitchen hearth. This was always heaped plentifully with the rubbish of his day's labour. As the foundation of the fire, there would be a goodly sized backlog of red oak, which, after being sheltered from rain or damp above a century, still hissed with the heat, and distilled streams of water from each end, as if the tree had been cut down within a week or two. Next these were large sticks, sound, black, and heavy, which had lost the principle of decay, and were indestructible except by fire, wherein they glowed like red-hot bars of iron. On this solid basis, Tabitha would rear a lighter structure, composed of the splinters of door panels, ornamented mouldings, and such quick combustibles, 
which caught like straw, and threw a brilliant blaze high up the spacious flue, making its sooty sides visible almost to the chimney top. Meantime, the gleam of the old kitchen would be chased out of the cobwebbed corners and away from the dusky cross beams overhead, and driven nobody could tell whither, while Peter smiled like a gladsome man, and Tabitha seemed a picture of comfortable age. All this, of course, was but an emblem of the bright fortune which the destruction of the house would shed upon its occupants. While the dry pine was flaming and crackling, like an irregular discharge of fairy musketry, Peter sat looking and listening, in a pleasant state of excitement. But, when the brief blaze and uproar were succeeded by the dark red glow, the substantial heat, and the deep singing sound, which were to last throughout the evening, his humor became talkative. One night, the hundredth time, he teased Tabitha to tell him something new about his great-granduncle. You have been sitting in that chimney corner fifty-five years, old Tabby, and must have heard many a tradition about him, said Peter. Did not you tell me that, when you first came to the house, there was an old woman sitting where you sit now, who had been housekeeper to the famous Peter Goldthwaite? So there was, Mr. Peter, answered Tabitha, and she was near about a hundred years old. She used to say that she and old Peter Goldthwaite had often spent a sociable evening by the kitchen fire pretty much as you and I are doing now, Mr. Peter. The old fellow must have resembled me in more points than one, said Peter, complacently, or he never would have grown so rich. But, methinks, he might have invested the money better than he did no interest exclamation mark nothing but good security exclamation mark and the house to be torn down to come at it. What made him hide it so snug, Tabby? Because he could not spend it, said Tabitha, for as often as he went to unlock the chest, the old scratch came behind and caught his arm. The money, they say, was paid Peter out of his purse, and he wanted Peter to give him a deed of this house and land, which Peter swore he would not do. Just as I swore to John Brown, my old partner, remarked Peter. But this is all nonsense, Tabby. I don't believe the story. Well, it may not be just the truth, said Tabitha, for some folks say that Peter did make over the house to the old scratch, and that's the reason it has always been so unlucky to them that lived in it. And as soon as Peter had given him the deed, the chest flew open, and Peter caught up a handful of the gold. But, lo and behold exclamation mark there was nothing in his fist but a parcel of old rags. Hold your tongue, you silly old tabby, cried Peter in great wrath. They were as good golden guineas as ever bore the effigies of the King of England. It seems as if I could recollect the whole circumstance, and how I, or old Peter, or whoever it was, thrust in my hand, or his hand, and drew it out all of a blaze with gold. Old rags, indeed. But it was not an old woman's legend that would discourage Peter Goldthwaite. All night long he slept among pleasant dreams, and awoke at daylight with a joyous throb of the heart which few are fortunate enough to feel beyond their boyhood. Day after day he labored hard without wasting a moment, except at mealtimes, when Tabitha summoned him to the pork and cabbage, or such other sustenance as she had picked up, or Providence had sent them. Being a truly pious man, Peter never failed to ask a blessing, if the food were none of the best, then so much the more earnestly, as it was more needed semicolon nor to return thanks, if the dinner had been scanty yet for the good appetite, which was better than a sick stomach at a feast. Then did he hurry back to his toil, and, in a moment, was lost to sight in a cloud of dust from the older walls, though sufficiently perceptible to the ear by the clatter which he raised in the midst of it. How enviable is the consciousness of being usefully employed! Nothing troubled Peter, or nothing but those phantoms of the mind which seem like vague recollections, yet have also the aspect of presentiments. He often paused with his axe uplifted in the air, and said to himself, comma, Peter Goldthwaite, did you never strike this blow before? Or, Peter, what need of tearing the whole house down? Think a little while, and you will remember where the gold is hidden. Days and weeks passed on, however, without any remarkable discovery. Sometimes, indeed, a lean, grey rat peeped forth at the lean, grey man, wondering what devil had got into the old house which had always been so peaceable till now. And, occasionally, Peter sympathized with the sorrows of a female mouse, who had brought five or six pretty, little, 
soft and delicate young ones into the world just in time to see them crushed by its ruin. But, as yet, no treasure. By this time, Peter, being as determined as fate and as diligent as time, had a made an end with the uppermost regions, and got down to the second story, where he was busy in one of the front chambers. It had formerly been the state bedchamber, and was honored by tradition as the sleeping apartment of Governor Dudley, and many other eminent guests. The furniture was gone. There were remnants of faded and tattered paper hangings, but larger spaces of bare wall ornamented with charcoal sketches, chiefly of people's heads in profile. These being specimens of Peter's youthful genius, it went more to his heart to obliterate them than if they had been pictures on a church wall by Michelangelo. One sketch, however, and that the best one, affected him differently. It represented a ragged man, partly supporting himself on a spade, and bending his lean body over a hole in the earth, with one hand extended to grasp something that he had found. But close behind him, with a fiendish laugh on his features, appeared a figure with horns, a tufted tail, and a cloven hoof. Avaunt, Satan! cried Peter. The man shall have his gold. Uplifting his axe, he hit the horned gentleman such a blow on the head as not only demolished him, but the treasure seeker also, and caused the whole scene to vanish like magic. Moreover, his axe broke quite through the plaster and laths, and discovered a cavity. Mercy on us, Mr. Peter, are you quarrelling with the old scratch? said Tabitha, who was seeking some fuel to put under the pot. Without answering the old woman, Peter broke down a further space of the wall, and laid open a small closet or cupboard, on one side of the fireplace, about breast high from the ground. It contained nothing but a brass lamp, covered with verdigris, and a dusty piece of parchment. While Peter inspected the latter, Tabitha seized the lamp, and began to rub it with her apron. There is no use in rubbing it, Tabitha, said Peter. It is not Aladdin's lamp, though I take it to be a token of as much luck. Look here Tabby. Tabitha took the parchment and held it close to her nose, which was saddled with a pair of iron-bound spectacles. But no sooner had she began to puzzle over it than she burst into a chuckling laugh, holding both her hands against her sides. You can't make a fool of the old woman, cried she. This is your own handwriting, Mr. Peter. The same as in the letter you sent me from Mexico. There is certainly a considerable resemblance, said Peter, again examining the parchment. But you know yourself, Tabby, that this closet must have been plastered up before you came to the house or I came into the world. No, this is old Peter Goldthwaite's writing. These columns of pounds, shillings, and pence are his figures, denoting the amount of the treasure, and this at the bottom is, doubtless, a reference to the place of concealment. But the ink has either faded or peeled off, so that it is absolutely illegible. What a pity! Well, this lamp is as good as new. That's some comfort, said Tabitha. A lamp! thought Peter that indicates light on my researches. For the present, Peter felt more inclined to ponder on this discovery than to resume his labors. After Tabitha had gone downstairs, he stood poring over the parchment, at one of the front windows, which was so obscured with dust that the sun could barely throw an uncertain shadow of the casement across the floor. Peter forced it open, and looked out upon the great street of the town, while the sun looked in at his old house. The air, though mild, and even warm, thrilled Peter as with a dash of water. It was the first day of the January thaw. The snow lay deep upon the housetops, but it was rapidly dissolving into millions of water drops, which sparkled downwards through the sunshine, with the noise of a summer shower beneath the eaves. Along the street, the trodden snow was as hard and solid as a pavement of white marble, and had not yet grown moist in the spring-like temperature. But when Peter thrust forth his head, he saw that the inhabitants, if not the town, were already thawed out by this warm day, after two or three weeks of winter weather. It gladdened him a gladness with a sigh breathing through it to see the stream of ladies, gliding along the slippery sidewalks, with their red cheeks set off by quilted hoods, boas, and sable capes, like roses amidst a new kind of foliage. The sleigh bells jingled to and fro continually sometimes announcing the arrival of a sleigh from Vermont, laden with the frozen bodies of porkers, or sheep, and perhaps a deer or two, 
sometimes of a regular market man, with chickens, geese, and turkeys, comprising the whole colony of a barnyard, and sometimes of a farmer and his dame, who had come to town partly for the ride, partly to go a-shopping, and partly for the sale of some eggs and butter. This couple rode in an old-fashioned square sleigh, which had served them twenty winters, and stood twenty summers in the sun beside their door. Now, a gentleman and lady skimmed the snow in an elegant car, shaped somewhat like a cockle shell. Now, a stage sleigh, with its cloth curtains thrust aside to admit the sun, dashed rapidly down the street, whirling in and out among the vehicles that obstructed its passage. Now came, round a corner, the similitude of Noah's Ark on runners, being an immense open sleigh with seats for fifty people, and drawn by a dozen horses. This spacious receptacle was populous with merry maids and merry bachelors, merry girls and boys, and merry old folks, all alive with fun, and grinning to the full width of their mouths. They kept up a buzz of babbling voices and low laughter, and sometimes burst into a deep, joyous shout, which the spectators answered with three cheers, while a gang of roguish boys let drive their snowballs right among the pleasure party. The sleigh passed on, and, when concealed by a bend of the street, was still audible by a distant cry of merriment. Never had Peter beheld a livelier scene than was constituted by all these accessories, the bright sun, the flashing water drops, the gleaming snow, the cheerful multitude, the variety of rapid vehicles, and the jingle jangle of merry bells which made the heart dance to their music. Nothing dismal was to be seen, except that peaked piece of antiquity, Peter Goldthwaite's house which might well look sad externally, since such a terrible consumption was preying on its insides. And Peter's gaunt figure, half visible in the projecting second story, was worthy of his house. Peter! How goes it, friend Peter? cried a voice across the street, as Peter was drawing in his head. Look out here, Peter! Peter looked, and saw his old partner, Mr. John Brown, on the opposite sidewalk, portly and comfortable with his furred cloak thrown open, disclosing a handsome surtout beneath. His voice had directed the attention of the whole town to Peter Goldthwaite's window, and to the dusty scarecrow which appeared at it. I say, Peter, cried Mr. Brown again, what the devil are you about there, that I hear such a racket whenever I pass by? You are repairing the old house, I suppose comma making and you one of it, eh? Too late for that, I am afraid, Mr. Brown, replied Peter. If I make it new, it will be new inside and out, from the cellar upwards. Had not you better let me take the job? said Mr. Brown, significantly. Not yet, answered Peter, hastily shutting the window, for, ever since he had been in search of the treasure, he hated to have people stare at him. As he drew back, ashamed of his outward poverty, yet proud of the secret wealth within his grasp, a haughty smile shone out on Peter's visage with precisely the effect of the dim sunbeams in the squalid chamber. He endeavoured to assume such a mien as his ancestor had probably worn, when he gloried in the building of a strong house for a home to many generations of his posterity. But the chamber was very dark to his snow-dazzled eyes, and very dismal too, in contrast with the living scene that he had just looked upon. His brief glimpse into the street had given him a forcible impression of the manner in which the world kept itself cheerful and prosperous by social pleasures and an intercourse of business, while he, in seclusion, was pursuing an object that might possibly be a phantasm, by a method which most people would call madness. It is one great advantage of a gregarious mode of life that each person rectifies his mind by other minds, and squares his conduct to that of his neighbours, so as seldom to be lost in eccentricity. Peter Goldthwaite had exposed himself to this influence by merely looking out of the window for a while, he doubted whether there were any hidden chest of gold, and, in that case, whether he was so exceedingly wise to tear the house down, only to be convinced of its non-existence. But this was momentary. Peter, the destroyer, resumed the task which fate had assigned him, nor faltered again till it was accomplished. In the course of his search, he met with many things that are usually found in the ruins of an old house, and also with some that are not. What seemed most to the purpose was a rusty key, which had been thrust into a chink of the wall, with a wooden label appended to the handle, bearing the initials, P. G. 
Another singular discovery was that of a bottle of wine, walled up in an old oven. A tradition ran in the family, that Peter's grandfather, a jovial officer in the old French war, had set aside many dozens of the precious liquor for the benefit of topers then unborn. Peter needed no cordial to sustain his hopes, and therefore kept the wine to gladden his success. Many halfpence did he pick up, that had been lost through the cracks of the floor, and some few Spanish coins, and the half of a broken sixpence, which had doubtless been a love token. There was likewise a silver coronation medal of George III. But old Peter Goldthwaite's strong box fled from one dark corner to another, or otherwise eluded the second Peter's clutches, till, should he seek much farther, he must burrow into the earth. We will not follow him in his triumphant progress, step by step. Suffice it that Peter worked like a steam engine, and finished, in that one winter, the job which all the former inhabitants of the house, with time and the elements to aid them, had only half done in a century. Except the kitchen, every room and chamber was now gutted. The house was nothing but a shell, comma, the apparition of a house, comma, as unreal as the painted edifices of a theatre. It was like the perfect rind of a great cheese, in which a mouse had dwelt and nibbled till it was a cheese no more. And Peter was the mouse. What Peter had torn down, Tabitha had burned up, for she wisely considered that, without a house, they should need no wood to warm it, and therefore economy was nonsense. Thus the whole house might be said to have dissolved in smoke, and flown up among the clouds, through the great black flue of the kitchen chimney. It was an admirable parallel to the feet of the man who jumped down his own throat. On the night between the last day of winter and the first of spring, every chink and cranny had been ransacked, except within the precincts of the kitchen. This fated evening was an ugly one. A snowstorm had set in some hours before and was still driven and tossed about the atmosphere by a real hurricane, which fought against the house as if the prince of the air, in person, were putting the final stroke to Peter's labours. The framework being so much weakened, and the inward props removed, it would have been no marvel if, in some stronger wrestle of the blast, the rotten walls of the edifice, and all the peaked roofs, had come crushing down upon the owner's head. He, however, was careless of the peril but as wild and restless as the night itself, or as the flame that quivered up the chimney at each roar of the tempestuous wind. The wine, Tabitha! he cried. My grandfather's rich old wine. We will drink it now. Tabitha arose from her smoke-blackened bench in the chimney corner, and placed the bottle before Peter, close beside the old brass lamp, which had likewise been the prize of his researches. Peter held it before his eyes, and, looking through the liquid medium, beheld the kitchen illuminated with a golden glory, which also enveloped Tabitha and gilded her silver hair, and converted her mean garments into robes of queenly splendour. It reminded him of his golden dream. Mr. Peter, remarked Tabitha, must the wine be drunk before the money is found? The money is found, exclaimed Peter, with a sort of fierceness. The chest is within my reach. I will not sleep, till I have turned this key in the rusty lock. But, First of all, let us drink. There being no corkscrew in the house, he smote the neck of the bottle with old Peter Goldthwaite's rusty key, and decapitated the sealed cork at a single blow. He then filled two little china teacups, which Tabitha had brought from the cupboard. So clear and brilliant was this aged wine that it shone within the cups, and rendered the sprig of scarlet flowers, at the bottom of each, more distinctly visible than when there had been no wine there. Its rich and delicate perfume wasted itself round the kitchen. Drink, Tabitha! cried Peter. Blessings on the honest old fellow who set aside this good liquor for you and me. And here's to Peter Goldthwaite's memory. And good cause have we to remember him, quoth Tabitha, as she drank. How many years, and through what changes of fortune and various calamity, had that bottle hoarded up its effervescent joy? to be quaffed at last by two such boon companions. A portion of the happiness of the former age had been kept for them, and was now set free, in a crowd of rejoicing visions, to sport amid the storm and desolation of the present time. Until they have finished the bottle, we must turn our eyes elsewhere. It so chanced that, on this stormy night, Mr. John Brown found himself ill at ease in his wire-cushioned armchair, by the glowing grate of anthracite which heated his handsome parlour. 
He was naturally a good sort of a man, and kind and pitiful whenever the misfortunes of others happened to reach his heart through the padded vest of his own prosperity. This evening he had thought much about his old partner, Peter Goldthwaite, his strange vagaries, and continual ill luck, the poverty of his dwelling, at Mr. Brown's last visit, and Peter's crazed and haggard aspect when he had talked with him at the window. Poor fellow! thought Mr. John Brown. Poor, crack-brained Peter Goldthwaite. For old acquaintance sake, I ought to have taken care that he was comfortable this rough winter. These feelings grew so powerful that, in spite of the inclement weather, he resolved to visit Peter Goldthwaite immediately. The strength of the impulse was really singular. Every shriek of the blast seemed a summons, or would have seemed so, had Mr. Brown been accustomed to hear the echoes of his own fancy in the wind. Much amazed at such active benevolence, he huddled himself in his cloak, muffled his throat and ears in comforters and handkerchiefs, and, thus fortified, bade defiance to the tempest. But the powers of the air had rather the best of the battle. Mr. Brown was just weathering the corner, by Peter Goldthwaite's house, when the hurricane caught him off his feet, tossed him face downward into a snow bank, and proceeded to bury his protuberant part beneath fresh drifts. There seemed little hope of his reappearance earlier than the next thaw. At the same moment his hat was snatched away, and whirled aloft into some far distant region, whence no tidings have as yet returned. Nevertheless Mr. Brown contrived to burrow a passage through the snow drift, and, with his bare head bent against the storm, floundered onward to Peter's door. There was such a creaking and groaning and rattling, and such an ominous shaking throughout the crazy edifice, that the loudest trap would have been inaudible to those within. He therefore entered, without ceremony, and groped his way to the kitchen. His intrusion, even there, was unnoticed. Peter and Tabitha stood with their backs to the door, stooping over a large chest, which, apparently, they had just dragged from a cavity, or concealed closet, on the left side of the chimney. By the lamp in the old woman's hand, Mr. Brown saw that the chest was barred and clamped with iron, strengthened with iron plates and studded with iron nails, so as to be a fit receptacle in which the wealth of one century might be hoarded up for the wants of another. Peter Goldthwaite was inserting a key into the lock. Oh Tabitha! cried he, with tremulous rapture, how shall I endure the effulgence? The gold exclamation marked the bright, bright gold. Methinks I can remember my last glance at it, just as the iron-plated lid fell down. And ever since, being seventy years, it has been blazing in secret, and gathering its splendor against this glorious moment. It will flash upon us like the noonday sun. Then shade your eyes, Mr. Peter," said Tabitha, with somewhat less patience than usual. But, for mercy's sake, do turn the key. And, with a strong effort of both hands, Peter did force the rusty key through the intricacies of the rusty lock. Mr. Brown, in the meantime, had drawn near, and thrust his eager visage between those of the other two, at the instant that Peter threw up the lid. No sudden blaze illuminated the kitchen. What's here? exclaimed Tabitha, adjusting her spectacles, and holding the lamp over the open chest. Old Peter Goldthwaite's hoard of old rags. Pretty much so, Tabby, said Mr. Brown, lifting a handful of the treasure. Oh! What a ghost of dead and buried wealth had Peter Goldthwaite raised, to scare himself out of his scanty wits with all. Here was the semblance of an incalculable sum, enough to purchase the whole town, and build every street anew, but which, vast as it was, no sane man would have given a solid sixpence for. What then, in sober earnest, were the delusive treasures of the chest? Why, here were old provincial bills of credit, and treasury notes and bills of land, banks, and all other bubbles of the sort, from the first issue, above a century and a half ago, down nearly to the revolution. Bills of a thousand pounds were intermixed with parchment pennies, and worth no more than they. And this, then, is old Peter Goldthwaite's treasure," said John Brown. Your namesake, Peter, was something like yourself, and, when the provincial currency had depreciated fifty or seventy-five per cent, he bought it up in expectation of a rise. I have heard my grandfather say that old Peter gave his father a mortgage of this very house and land, to raise cash for his silly project. But the currency kept sinking, 
till nobody would take it as a gift, and there was old Peter Goldthwaite, like Peter II, with thousands in his strong box and hardly a coat to his back. He went mad upon the strength of it. But, never mind, Peter. It is just the sort of capital for building castles in the air. The house will be down about our ears, cried Tabitha, as the wind shook it with increasing violence. Let it fall, said Peter, folding his arms, as he seated himself upon the chest. No, no, my old friend Peter, said John Brown. I have house room for you and Tabby, and a safe vault for the chest of treasure. Tomorrow we will try to come to an agreement about the sale of this old house. Real estate is well up and I could afford you a pretty handsome price. And I, observed Peter Goldthwaite, with reviving spirits, have a plan for laying out the cash to great advantage. Why, as to that, muttered John Brown to himself, we must apply to the next court for a guardian to take care of the solid cash, and if Peter insists upon speculating, he may do it, to his heart's content, with old Peter Goldthwaite's treasure.